So maybe we'll uh, now jump to a Q&A and uh, discussion and whoever would like to begin. There are more points I'm sure we can explore. <laughs> yeah, April. If you can just introduce yourself and then uh, pose the question. Sure. Uh, my name is April. Right. One second. Yeah. Just speak into the mic. Hi, my name is April Alderdice, and I'm the CEO of Microenergy Credits, a solar energy company here in India. And uh, my question relates to financing. Um, and so it seems like uh, you know one of the biggest barriers is really you know how do you pay for this um, given the budgets? And I was just wondering, you know, in your uh, talk so far, either in Delhi or your observations here, you know, what what ideas do you have for uh, Mumbai to be able to finance um, some initiatives? So one of the things that I've learned since I've been here is that the government structure and finance structures are so radically different that I can't pretend to be able to offer you good advice about what to do here. But what I can do is describe perhaps some how we've uh, dealt with some of the obstacles in the United States. So one of the things that we've found it has been our biggest obstacle has been removing the regulatory barriers that TOD developers have faced. Historically in the US, it has been more expensive and more time consuming to do TOD than to do conventional development because our regulations uh, directly contradicted our policies. And so we had all these wonderful TOD policies, but then we made it illegal to actually implement them in a you know, hundred small ways. So we've been trying to go methodically uh, through each of those regulations and fix them. And much of my lecture is based upon my experience removing regulatory obstacles. And we remove those regulatory obstacles in large part by finding the smartest developers and working with them to help them figure out, like, because they had the most hands-on experience running into problems that we would have never guessed. So working really closely with them in order to develop solutions and testing solutions with them before we uh, passed laws uh, has helped us to avoid the, the law of unintended consequences. Um, and I really like working with developers because their motivations are simple, right? Um, for most, uh, most of the nonprofit sector and government agencies, their motivations are complicated and oftentimes contradictory. Developers are just looking for one thing. So it's quite easy to get into alignment with them and to develop uh, regulations that ensure that the private sector will make money off of creating the public good, right? And that's really the number one rule of TOD finance is establishing the rules so that the private sector can make the most money off of doing the thing that benefits the public the most. And conversely, making sure that it is more expensive for the private sector to do things that harm the public, right? So for 50 years in America, we had those things backwards. So we've spent the last 15 years trying to turn things around to make it possible for, the, for private capital to create um, TOD. The next thing that we've had to do is to be smarter about and more creative about the use of public money. So one thing that we needed to recognize was that <clears throat> uh, Histor you know, in the late 20th century, the transport agencies saw their job as following behind development. You know, so a developer would do a giant automobile-oriented project in the countryside, and then the highway agency would say, oh, there's this giant thing here, let's calculate the vehicle trips, and then build the road to serve it. Um, of course, that's extremely expensive and results in a massive wealth transfer from the core city taxpayers, uh, citizens paying taxes to the highway agency that is now being spent only to, develop, to, to benefit uh, a small number of developers out in the countryside. Bad policy. 
So we stopped doing that um, and instead realized that it's a lot cheaper to spend our highway dollars helping development next to transit in the existing core um, than it is to spend highway dollars building highways, right? If I build in the core, uh, I eliminate about 80% of my motor vehicle trips and the trips that remain are about 75% shorter. Big difference in travel behavior, uh, urban transit oriented infill compared to isolated suburban auto oriented. So we realized that we could spend our highway dollars on sidewalks and uh, street trees and urban amenity in order to make it possible to shift the development market towards the development that created the greatest public good. So uh, that sort of shift occurred. Um, another thing that we recognized was that the real estate finance industry and the insurance industries did not understand transit-oriented development. And so we needed to collect data for them to show them how TOD behaved differently, what its market acceptance was, who wanted to buy in, in TOD, how many cars those families had, uh, and that in fact the banks would make more money if they financed these TOD projects with less parking and more density, right? You would think that the banks would collect this data on their own, they did not. We had to collect the data for them. Um, and the same was true with the insurance industry. So it, what we found in the United States, this is a long way of saying, there was plenty of money. We just needed to be smarter about spending it on the right things and pooling resources, you know, spending highway dollars on transit, um, spending private dollars on the right thing, um, and aligning uh, all of the, uh, the financial pro formas to focus on the public good. Does that make sense? Okay. Great. Um, you know, I think uh, our problem is very different. We have uh, a city which is already uh, very congested in terms of density and our transit oriented development uh, uh, is um, the the ridership is in place we can't densify these areas any further if anything we need to extend our transport systems into new areas because uh, intensifying development in areas that are already congested uh, just makes the situation worse so um, we have to think carefully about how we can learn from the American experience. As far as parking is concerned, I think it's absolutely correct that we need to rethink the way we price parking. One fact I think many people have not realized is that in Mumbai, parking costs uh, about one third of a liter of petrol. It's 20 rupees uh, for an hour of parking downtown and a liter is 60 rupees. In the US, um, petrol is the same price, about a dollar a liter, four, four and a half dollars a gallon. And uh, parking in Manhattan is $25 an hour. So here it's one third of a liter of petrol, there it's 25 liters of petrol. So I think we need to rethink these <coughs> policies uh, in relation to how we manage that very important yep. zone between pedestrians and traffic. I think that's correct. I think your, your point about transit capacity is very well taken. In fact, that's my greatest concern, my experience wandering around Mumbai and taking the trains. Um, you have fantastic transit ridership and you have serious, what we would call core capacity problems. Um, I could imagine, and given the amount of crowding on public transit today, uh, you could double the capacity of your system and still experience crowding. Uh, there's so much latent demand for transit um, in the core. And adding more density onto an existing uh, crowded line doesn't help. So we have 
uh, it's ridiculous for me to even compare the San Francisco situation. We have some crowding problems in a very brief period in the peak. Um, and we're working very hard to deal with that in part by rethinking land use and trying to do what we can to increase transit-oriented employment outside of the San Francisco core. Um, more jobs in the San Francisco core um, are putting extreme strain on our highway and rail system in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, and to the point where we're looking at spending probably 20 US billion dollars um, uh, doing a new line underneath San Francisco Bay uh, over the next uh, 20 years or so in order to address that problem. Uh, it would be easier to address that problem by rethinking land use and not simply by um, uh, increasing density infinitely, but by recognizing that there's a correct zone, there's an ideal zone of density. If you're not dense enough, you're too auto-oriented, it's difficult to make all of the functions of retail be present. Um, if you're too dense, it also becomes very difficult to make density work. And I think that a city that has been masterful at finding just the right density zone uh, is Vancouver, British Columbia, and its suburbs that have had a very sophisticated conversation about getting density right in that perfect zone where things are walkable and green, uh, but enough to support a very high quality of transit service. Um, here in Mumbai, you, all of your density is already in the zone, and there's, there, you, you have to go you know, out into farmland in order to get to densities that are too low. So I think your challenge is not so much about density, but rather about transit capacity and over density. Yeah, we haven't uh, heard, I think, one, given one, a wide shift improve. One no. supplementary question. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you coordinate uh, land use and densification and your transportation planning? That's a good question. So it's rather complicated to try to explain how transportation planning works in San Francisco. Um, uh, San Francisco has 26 public transit operators uh, that don't talk to each other. Uh, funding is raised, uh, so in the, uh, the San Francisco region, there are 30-odd cities, nine what we call counties, um, and a variety of regional agencies that are made up of multiple counties. All of these organizations have control over some aspect of transportation funding, and the only agencies that have control over land use are at the smallest unit, which is the municipality, which in a Mumbai scale would be as if every individual neighborhood in your city had complete control over land use within its neighborhood. It is politically a ridiculous situation. Uh, and so getting anything done requires an extremely high level of consensus, uh, bringing many government agencies together uh, and in particular, using the private sector to put pressure on government agencies. So there is one regional organization that we have that tries to, uh, that has significant funding authority and tries to use its limited funds to leverage other people's money. They are also, importantly, the organization responsible for helping California meet its CO2 reduction goals. So our Metropolitan Transportation Commission is required to develop a regional plan that meets CO2 reduction targets. And it has been CO2 that has allowed that agency to get traction in a way that was not politically possible before. Californians are pretty serious about climate change and doing what we need to do uh, to support the, you know, our responsibilities to the planet. Uh, in California, 40% of our CO2 emissions comes from transport, and of that 40%, about 70% comes from personal cars. So pretty much everything that California is going to do in the next decade to meet its CO2 obligations will be in the mobility sector. Um, and so as a result, there has been a lot of pressure to coordinate land use planning to help reduce car traffic to meet our CO2 goals, and the regional agencies 
embarrass the local officials into complying. It's, and it's really about social pressure, right? That's, that's what we do, is we single out elected officials who are doing good, and we single out for public shaming those who are doing bad, uh, and let the public vote as they may. National Association of Civil Engineers has accorded an overall grade of D minus uh, when it comes to the United States maintenance of public infrastructure. Um, Senator Bernie Sanders has spoken about how Washington needs to earmark a trillion dollars over the next decade to turn that around. Uh, my question is a twofold question. One, um, in your opinion, why has there been this slump in maintenance of public infrastructure in the United States? And number two, with respect to maintenance, what can India learn or cities like Bombay learn from the mistakes that the United States has made? Thank that, you. That is a very astute question. Yes, the state of American infrastructure is pathetic. Um, and not only is our infrastructure crumbling, it is so much more expensive to let our infrastructure crumble than it is to do the regular maintenance needed. We have plenty of money to maintain our roads. Um, and we're spending 10 times as much to let them deteriorate and then rebuild them. It is an absurd situation. Um, it's a complicated problem. There are many reasons behind that problem. I would argue that perhaps the primary reason behind that problem is the delegation of planning and funding authority um, from the federal level to the state level to the point now where almost all transportation funding is occurring at the municipal level. Um, so transportation funding that occurs at the municipal level is in the hands of elected officials who have term limits, right? So if, you're, if, you're, uh, if you are, are sitting on a city council in a small city and you're responsible for the bulk of transportation funding, it is very much in your interest to build something new which is visible and will help you with your reelection than it is to simply maintain what was already there and have nobody notice. So particularly when nobody is going to notice that you've not maintained the roads until uh, your term limit has expired and you're no longer in office, right? So our terrible situation of maintenance is partly a result of our political structure and the fact that there's no state or national leadership on infrastructure any longer. You know, the, those, the pictures that I, that I took, uh, you know, showed you of the interstate freeway system, that was 100% federal investment. Well, not 100%, but nearly entirely federal investment. We don't build stuff like that anymore, let alone maintain stuff like that. The other problem is a problem of transportation performance measurement. We still believe that we can eliminate congestion through adding just one more traffic lane, right? I know it didn't work for the previous three traffic lanes, but I promise you this time, finally just adding just one more lane, finally it will solve the congestion problem. All of our transportation funding formulas are structured under this belief about endless capacity expansion solving the congestion problem. We do not include in our transportation funding formulas anything about maintenance. So we're starting to solve this problem. Uh, only an extremely wealthy country can afford to not maintain its infrastructure. Um, so uh, please don't waste your money uh, as we have. Great. Who else? Rathan, you want to say something? No. Yeah. Please introduce yourself and just use the mic. I'm Satish Nangaukar from The Hindu. I wanted to ask you, um, I don't know whether you had a chance to study the metro lines and, and uh, the transit-oriented uh, uh, development that's uh, undergoing currently in, in Mombai. Uh, did you have a chance to? No. Assume, there, assume I know nothing. There, there is about six, seven metro links uh, which have been planned, and uh, the largest is a 33-kilometer underground uh, metro line connecting south to uh, 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 seeps in Andheri. Mm -hmm. And uh, so what, what do you think, is this the right uh, kind of uh, uh, TOD we should go for or uh, for a city of, of this size and this density? 
So I, I can't. Which, which is the sort of right way forward, you know? Yeah. So I, uh, I, I cannot speak to the complexity of the project here. I really do not know enough. Um, one thing that I am fairly certain of, um, given my experience wandering around your city, is you need additional mobility capacity. Um, and you need to provide it in the most space efficient way possible. Uh, and oftentimes that will mean, uh, you know, high capacity metro systems. Now that said, um, particularly underground metro systems are very expensive. Um, I have no doubt that there will be some metro uh, uh, extensions here in Mumbai that will make good economic sense. Um, but I would urge you not to let the opportunity to build metro extensions allow you to continue to avoid managing your streets. In terms of return on investment, managing your existing streets and incremental upgrades of your existing uh, public transit systems uh, will always be, uh, will all, there will always be good investment. Now it doesn't say that you should do that at, and not do any metro expansion, but please manage your existing streets and make sure that you're making the most efficient and productive use of your street system um, before you assume that your only option is very expensive uh, and long metro extensions. And just to, if I can quickly add, I think in the past six months has been pretty landmark. First, we took the decision to do elevated metro. That was around seven, eight years back. And then we had a new metropolitan commissioner who took the decision to go underground in 2011. Mm -hmm. And just six months back, the new set of officials have realized that underground is crazy in terms of costs. And we are already seeing in the line three a cost overrun even before work has begun. So cost overrun has already happened. So exactly the point that you mentioned. And these are continuously the arguments which are happening in Mumbai as well. Yeah, please. Thank you very much for your ideas that you have given. One idea that I have taken is renting instead of owning. <coughs> we are talking about one coastal road which will lead to more congestion in the line and it is very ugly thing also. I don't know how many persons will be able to use that. I think you know about the coastal road. The, the which road? Coastal road. Oh, the we are planning uh, because our trains are so overcrowded that mm -hmm. ever, about uh, every, uh, every day 10 to 15 persons die because of overcrowding. Yes. So they are thinking of various options. Mm -hmm. One option is to have a coastal road mm -hmm. which will take the traffic, but that will be by the cars, mm -hmm. which will, I don't know where they will be parking in the Arabian Sea or wherever, I don't know that. <coughs> but your idea that we should be renting. So why not we have a system of a uh, sea route, you know, sea, I mean, which will be, I mean, which can go on ferrying instead of uh, having a coastal road which will be a eyesore and a problem. I mean, it should add to the problem rather than solve the problem. What is your idea about that? Coastal, uh, waterways transport you are talking about? Yeah, yeah. Ferries. Uh, you know, again, I don't know enough about the geography of a larger city. Um, I know that uh, many regions in the United States um, have elaborate ferry systems. Um, we do a lot of work with the uh, Washington State ferry system in the Seattle metro region. Um, I've spent a lot of time in places like Hong Kong and Sydney um, to understand the power of making ferry systems work. Um, they're a little challenging, though, in terms of uh, um, ground side access. Uh, oftentimes ferry terminals are not located in the most convenient location. It's hard to get to the center of things. Um, in fact, even if you can get to a very dense waterside development, when we think about transit-oriented development, we tend to draw big circles. And ferry terminals, by their very nature, you know, you lose half of the circle. And oftentimes, uh, this, the other half of the circle includes sensitive coastal lands um, or you can't get the boat very close to the shore, so you end up with um, some significant gaps. So ferries um, are an incredibly important part of many regions' mobility systems, um, but they're just one technology. In fact, one thing that um, we find again and again in transportation is 
uh, a tendency to fixate on single modes of transportation, thinking that they will solve all problems. You know, there are people who think that if only everyone rides bikes, right, that will solve all of our problems, or monorail will solve all of our problems. Uh, in San Francisco, there are people who think that ferries will solve all, all of our problems. In fact, ferries are a useful tool in certain circumstances, um, and I'm a big fan of always using the best tool for the job. Great. Any other questions, or maybe everybody wants to leave time? You want to? Hello. No. Okay. Yeah. Please. Uh, at Perio, your experience and comparison from India and US. Can you explain the what is effective for uh, uh, development of smart cities and uh, transportation? Is it uh, privatization is more effective than public sector? Um. So my favorite aspect about smart cities and new town development is they always require an effective partnership between the private and the public. In fact, they always require an effective partnership among many public sector agencies and many private investors. So the challenge with smart cities is figuring out who is going to convene all of these parties and help them come to consensus and help them form an enduring agreement that will benefit everyone, right? That is the fundamental challenge of smart cities. And who the leader is doesn't matter, right? Um, in my experience around the world, uh, I've seen that leadership can emerge from any one of you know, that group, um, but it requires effective, powerful, uh, uh, you know, somebody who really wants to make it happen and then sufficient leadership among all of the other organizations to keep it moving forward. Um, so um, sometimes it is the private sector that is the energy behind. Sometimes it's the public sector. In the public sector, sometimes it's the municipality. Sometimes it is a regional agency. Sometimes it is the transit operator. It doesn't matter, so long as you bring the right people to the table. Yeah, Lena. You wanted Priya, you wanted to ask him? Ratan. He's been just sitting silent, I've been prodding him. <laughs> but he's making copious amounts of notes. <laughs> My name is Ratan Bhatlipa. Uh, one of the key things is, uh, do you think privatization is really going to help? <laughs> uh, so that's a kind of loaded question. Um, I think that there is a role for privatization, and when we look at experience around the world, it's clear that sometimes privatization is a complete disaster, and other times it's really good. So again, the challenge is getting the public and private into alignment so that there is private profit and public good at the same time, right? That's the challenge. Uh, so that means regulating the private sector in the right way, it always means being very clear about the desired outcomes and making sure that those outcomes are measurable and making sure that the public sector is committed to holding the private sector to achieving those outcomes, making sure that there are penalties worked into the agreement if the private sector doesn't meet the outcomes, also making sure that there's remedies built into the agreement if uh, as always happens, as you move into implementation, that the unexpected arises, right? So, you know, again, looking at the global best practices to understand why public-private partnerships have succeeded and also why they have failed to make sure that you don't follow the path of failure. Yeah. But, but in general, uh, I think that there's great opportunity uh, to harness the energy um, and the ambition of the private sector in order to help achieve the public good. In fact, I think it's essential. How do you, one, one quick other question is, do you have any answers or experiences into how you can get these officials from different authorities to talk to each other? <laughs> because, because that's our biggest yeah. problem. Well, that's the challenge. I mean, we right? have, we have round tables, we have forums for this, mm -hmm. but, but they come, eat biscuits and go. Yep. So, so. Um, <laughs> That is a challenge. Uh, it's, I think it's, uh, I mean, it's, it's particularly compounded here in India with the civil service system. 
um, having the um, uh, as fixed an institution as it is, right? I think it's, uh, it's harder here to get government to be dynamic um, and entrepreneurial than it is in other countries. Um, and so here it may actually need to rely more on the private sector for leadership than it does in other countries. Um, and then the challenge becomes how to keep the private sector from running amok and damaging the public good. Um, I, you know, I think how you make these things happen is the biggest challenge in every country. And this is one of the ways in which your country is extremely different from mine. And so I don't even know that I can provide you with relevant advice, right? I mean, only, and you know, in fact, I mean, this is true, you know, when I'm working in Russia or the, you know, United Arab Emirates. Um, I'm good at providing the technical advice and helping find language that inspires all of the different parties. But I don't think I can help you figure out how to get all of the parties to come to the table. That's, and I just quickly, culture. you know, uh, okay. As Nick, uh, what would be the key drivers? You know, like you said, CO2 emissions was one of the key drivers where you could align all of the different, mm -hmm. you know, stakeholders. So, what are the other drivers? You know, which we should look at so uh -huh. that these people converse probably for the greater good. That's I mean. right. Um, so, in San Francisco, uh, there is broad public consensus on housing affordability, right? So. Many of our regulations, we now argue about almost purely in housing affordability terms. It was how we eliminated minimum parking requirements, right? I mean, every parking space that we added to a unit increased the unit cost by 20% and decreased the number of units that we could build on a parcel by 20%. So by eliminating the parking, we could greatly increase the number of units and their affordability at no government cost, right? It became a very effective argument. Uh, in other places, I, I work a fair amount in a place called Salt Lake City. And Salt Lake City is a very conservative part of America. Uh, it's very religious. Um, uh, many people are Mormon, which is a, a particular branch of Christianity. and they don't have the same values that I do, but I like them because they, they are very clear about what their values are, and they're quite comfortable talking about their values. So when I go and I work in Salt Lake City and I talk about mobility policy, I don't talk about social policy, I talk about mobility policy, it's very easy for me to argue about mobility policy because I can speak their language and how their values are or are not reflected in terms of mobility policy. So this goes back to performance metrics, right? I use performance metrics to manipulate my enemies into changing. You know, rather than starting with what project do you want to build, I start with what are your values? What is important to you? And then I walk my clients through the process of translating those values into goals and then translating those goals into objectives that can be measured. And I back them into a completely different program of transportation funding by making sure that their projects, any project that they approve, actually reflects their values. And then when I score their projects, and it is a complete reversal, and they're like, well, well, you know, I mean, we didn't mean that. Like, we still want to build the highway, right? Then I'm able to go back and say, oh, yeah, well, of course you can build the highway. But, you know, where, where do you want to change your values? Where did we get your values wrong? Like, uh, but, I, you know, so it's what it's not in children's health is not important to you, right? Safety, that's not important, right? Air quality, like, should we, I can downgrade the air quality score. That's no problem. We'll, we'll put that to zero. Uh, you know, I, I want to help your highway project score. And then finally they start realizing that the, project that the projects that they thought they wanted, the thing that they started with, was not in fact what was getting them what they truly wanted. So performance metrics are a trick. Um, 
Hi, my name is Lena. I work here at the ORF. I, had a, I was wanting to have a discussion with you on the definition of smart city. Uh, it's caught on a lot in India, and everyone's very yeah. excited about the whole yes. idea. Yes. Now, you know, we are trying to build new cities yes. as smart cities. Mm -hmm. And I think if you ask a Cisco what a definition of a smart city is, he'll, they'll say digitally enabled. But I think if you are, most people who are excited by the idea are hoping to have a city where, you know, waste is managed right, and there's enough water, and there's affordable housing, and, you know, all that kind of thing. So many of us here at ORF are often wondering whether, you know, we are all going to get the smart city that we are looking at. But I want to also, so I want to discuss the definition, but I also want to ask you, could a smart city well-defined be the same kind of paradigm-changing uh, thing that you mentioned, what GM did in the 30s about selling a vision for living in America, which caught on and became a reality. Yeah. At that time, they may not have understood too many cars and all the pollution and, mm -hmm. and so on and so on. But at that time, it was attractive enough and powerful enough to drive both government and citizens to work towards it. And it seems like we need a, uh, a revolution like that. So. Um, no so so I, I love these marketing terms like smart city and of, like of course like who like do you want to live in a dumb city? You're, do you want to you don't want to live in a dumb city? Do you? Of course you want to live in a smart city, right? Because you know it's smart and like your kids will be smart and you know it, it's going to be awesome. Um, so of course these marketing terms are only as valuable. Um, as we're actually able to define, and again, more importantly, what do we, what do, we do? Measure, right? Measure what we mean. Um, and, and of course, that's where it gets tricky. Uh, I, a longer version of this lecture um, that is more appealing to American audiences um, talks a lot about this vision of the city of the future. You know, if you ask any American to draw a picture of the city of the future, they will either draw from imagery from the 1930s, from the Futurama exhibit, or at best they will draw from a cartoon show called The Jetsons, which aired in 1964, right? Our vision of the city of the future in the United States is stuck in 1964 and has not changed an inch since then. And the Walt Disney Corporation, right, the, the you know, one of the most creative, you know, institutions on the entire planet can't, for the life of themselves, figure out how to reinvent this Tomorrowland to actually have a relevant picture of the city of the future that doesn't look like the 1933 version. They have failed. They've completely failed. And I think this is at the root of our urban problems today. We look back upon this private automobile company's television commercial as the source of all of our imagery and excitement about the city of the future, right? We need a new set of images that generates excitement. We need a whole marketing campaign, right, that General Motors had. And it's tough because the things that we crave, they're subtle, right? They're subtle and they are not readily commoditized. Um, so it's one of the reasons why I talk about public health. Um, it's also one of the reasons why I talk a lot about our craving for social ability. Um, my Arab clients in Abu Dhabi um, did the most beautiful set of music videos of our plan uh, to try to translate the mobility and land use planning that we did there into terms that would be appealing uh, to an Emirati audience. And the parts of it that I found most deeply meaningful to me that are, are universally appealing is something as simple as having our children be able to walk and play independently, right? Living in a place where your children can learn to interact with each other and learn to interact with kids who are different than they are, right, in a safe, sociable space and not have to drive to that and go into some sort of fenced enclosure where you've got to, you know, pay your, you know, thousand rupees or whatever to get in the door. 
You know, so thinking about those emotionally resonant, but also substantive factors that make us love a place. Also thinking of the times that you've traveled, both here in India and abroad, of the places that really grabbed your heart, right? What was it about those places? Can you define those qualities that made you love those places? That is our challenge, because if you can't define them, you're not going to be able to build them new no matter how smart you call your smart city, right? That is what we all need to do is remember what is it that made a place that we remember so satisfying? What exactly were those qualities and how do we replicate them in a way that is economically um, and culturally appropriate for this place? And I don't have the answers, um, but I'm hoping that all of you collectively will help us find our way home.